Um, <clears throat> let's recap some of these things. We have convinced ourselves, I hope by now, that uh, there is the Hadley cell uh, thermally direct circulation and then there is uh, eddy transports beyond that and we can uh, reaffirm our concepts by looking at the upper troposphere where you do have uh, mid-latitude uh, westerlies and eddies and the subtropical jet and uh, subpolar uh, or polar jet stream uh, occurring there and of course we have the Hadley circulation and uh, the opposite of the trade winds. So trade winds are northeasterlies and southeasterlies in the uh, lower troposphere but when you go uh, uh, in the top uh, upper atmosphere, upper troposphere, obviously you have uh, momentum being transported, uh, west westerly momentum being transported poleward, right? So you have westerlies uh, here in the upper troposphere. So you can see that peculiar thing here. The upper atmosphere is pretty much westerlies all the way. Amazing, right? So Hadley circulation, subtropical jet stream, mid-latitude westerlies. So the entire upper atmosphere is uh, westerlies. Amazing. Strong zonal winds making northward transport just using the eddies. Whereas if you come close to the surface, you have trade winds that are well organized uh, compared to the mid-latitude where the westerly is hitting the surface and creating all these storms. In many sense, the um, upper level westerlies can put down weather systems on the surface at mid-latitudes. Okay? If you don't understand what I mean by that, uh, don't worry about it. So the strong uh, eddies in the upper atmosphere can put down circulation systems, the uh, low pressure and high pressure eddies we saw in the map of geopotential, for example, uh, can be put down from the top. Okay, that's the strong interaction between the upper troposphere and the lower troposphere in the mid latitudes because the entire system is uh, westerly with strong shear, of course, because the uh, westerlies are very strong in the upper atmosphere compared to the lower atmosphere. And the lower atmosphere, the zonal jet is very unstable. It's always producing these eddies. Okay, so the entire thing we did with the ED growth rates and so on, uh, and time scale of uh, growth rate or the time scale of weather systems is all related to this um, instability of the uh, zonal jet, the spontaneous uh, breakdown of the zonal jet into these uh, uh, eddies, right? So there are very elegant mathematical solutions associated with that. This is just to reaffirm our old concept again, looking at the meridional stream function uh, in the annual mean and for the boreal winter and boreal summer months. Well, the main thing to again remember is that the Hadley cell does do direct meridional transport, whereas the meridional uh, circulation cells in the mid-latitudes to the polar regions are very weak, as you can see here, compared to uh, the um, low latitudes and we said funnily enough Hadley cell despite all the talk about its role uh, it doesn't transport that much energy northward ocean ends up doing most of the work at uh, low latitudes okay so we haven't considered the longitudinal uh, variability of uh, uh, climate yet, uh, but we will do that here uh, a little bit if I can find my uh, cursor here. So I'm going to show various things here. So these are the, the Hadley cells and uh, here is the uh, seasonality of the Hadley cell. We have talked about this a lot so you can see that the polar fronts are shown and not much circulation is shown beyond that to uh, be consistent with the idea that the uh, feral cell and the polar cell that we talked about in the very beginning uh, are there but they're very weak. So what happens during the season? Uh, so you can see that the entire system moves uh, northward from spring to summer uh, with the sun and then shifts southward as the sun crosses the equator back into the southern hemisphere for the southern hemisphere uh, summer. Okay, so look at that. So the Hadley cell 
is completely shifting northward along with the polar fronts and southward along with the polar fronts with the seasons. And we are also showing here much more realistically that the tropopause is much higher in the deep tropics and dips as we go into uh, higher latitudes. Okay, We can add the ITCZ to it which we haven't seen much in this course at all and this is a simplistic uh, uh, depiction of the, had uh, the ITCZ as well. There are many issues here in terms of the asymmetry of the ITCZ with respect to the equator and so on and so forth. But you also see typical features here. For example, uh, during the boreal summer month, the ITCZ here or the Indian Tibetan region goes way north because of the land heating, uh, Tibetan plateau heating and so on, which is, there are lots of details that argue about whether the Tibetan heating is really important or whether there's the height of the mountain that's important and it turns out that if you look really at the ITCZ carefully over the Indian Ocean it doesn't just remain a single ITCZ here in the summer it splits because the ocean is very warm so you end up getting two ITCZs uh, here uh, and so on and so forth. Um, to look at our uh, subtropical highs and subpolar lows, they also have a strong seasonality, obviously. You can see that uh, the uh, highs shrink during the boreal summer months, and as the ITCZ shifts south in the winter months, the highs strengthen and expand, which is consistent with the Hadley cell, right? We said the Hadley cell uh, has more vigorous trade winds and uh, sinking and subtropical highs during the winter uh, month in the winter hemisphere. The jet stream is stronger in the winter hemisphere and so on. So the ITCZ shifts, the uh, convection shifts and the sinking motion becomes stronger in the winter hemisphere. Along with that you have the expansion and shrinking of the subpolar lows. So you can see that uh, these uh, shrink, those shrink, these expand and those expand. So there is a very strong relation but you can see that the land adds difficulties so you have permanent pressure centers like the Siberian high, the Icelandic low, Azores high, um, Alaska low and so on and so forth. The Southern Ocean is very different. It's like a channel, so it behaves quite differently as opposed to other oceans which have boundaries. We can add precipitation to make the story complete. So you can see the range of precipitations here greater than 150 millimeters per month to less than 25 millimeters. What do you want to look for here is basically uh, where the Hadley cell subsides is where you have clear weather uh, no rain so correspond to the desert so you have the big desert here this is at the same latitude but because of the monsoon it's not a desert so the desert shift north eastward uh, along these lines so you can see that uh, the high pressure basically means low rain so high rains East Asian monsoon go there Indian monsoon uh, East Coast West Coast differences uh, the Amazon uh, rainfall uh, Central uh, African uh, rainforests, uh, Indonesian rainforests, and so on and so forth. So I'll stop this podcast here, but uh, we will uh, look at a uh, couple of more things. Uh, actually, let me go back and finish the uh, historic characters as well. So this is uh, Dufont. Uh, I, I think his name is uh, actually French, maybe it's Defont, but in uh, Germany it's pronounced Defunt, I think. Uh, he contributed a lot to the understanding of uh, mid-latitude weather. Uh, this must be Eric Eady, I hope. Uh, this is Jules Charney, uh, who is, was a giant in the field. Meteorology was the first guy to try a weather forecast uh, in the 1950s, uh, was a prof at MIT. I am academically related to Charney because his student Mark Kane was my advisor. So Jules Charney in that son is my in that sense is my academic grandfather. Whoa, that's cool, right? So 
Um, I will uh, add a few uh, points from Holton's book just to kind of get ourselves a sense of how differently uh, that approach can be. The physics is the same, but to get there you can go through the mathematical expressions and derive eddy fluxes uh, and so on. So the chapters, uh, I think it's 10 uh, or whatever, general circulation chapter, uh, is really worth reading. There are other books uh, uh, as well, many books as well, but Holton is kind of a classic and I used Marshall and Plum, which is a more recent book. Nonetheless, uh, you should make sure that you read as much as you can to understand, but often that depends on which direction your research may go if you are a grad student. Okay. <laughs>